Okay. Janet, can you move on to the, the title slide? Let's see, let me get out of the chat here. And now my cue's not working to move the slide. Let's try this. That's gonna be cumbersome if I have to do that every time. I think you have to go into the presentation mode again. Uh, okay, how do you do that? Am I gonna have to stop sharing and? No, are you seeing the PowerPoint on Google Drive? I think so. Okay, in the top right where it says present, you should be able to click that button. No, I'm not seeing that. I'm not, maybe it's not on the drive. Okay, let's see. Sorry, guys. Okay, here we go. Yep, that's it. Okay. Um, so, okay, so we are very excited to be here today with you all. Um, we thank you for being here to attend today's web conference, uh, Restorative Justice, Exploring Alternative Ways of Achieving Justice for Sexual Assault Survivors and the Criminal Justice System in schools and in the workplace. I think it's, it went back to the regular view, Janet. I don't know why it would change. I'm in the present view in Google. Oh, okay. So what I think it is, is you, you, um, you're not on the, so you're, when you go to Zoom and you share your screen, um, does it take you back to a different screen? Um, well, I've got a couple of different choices. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I think that you're sharing one thing, but you're looking at a different thing. See, that's not in presenter view. Sorry, you guys. See, see, now it's in Google Slides, see, and there's the present button. So if yeah. I hit the, hit the present button, this is what I did before though, Shelby. And then it took you, okay, because when you hit the present button, I don't see, like, it's probably taking you to a different window because I can't see that. You, you can't? Can you see these slides? I can see the Google Slides on Google Drive. No, I mean, can you see them on the screen now? Yeah, I see them on the screen. Okay, so what's what's the problem? Um, so you is it full screen? Because I don't see the full screen. It is full screen on my screen. Yeah, I don't see that. Is, now I, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry guys, we tried to we tried a tech run, but apparently we didn't get it all. <laughs> okay, so can we move forward here, Shelby? Yeah. Awesome. Um, can you go back once? Okay. Um, so as you all may know, uh, this web conference series is being brought to you by the Guam Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Family Violence. Um, Cal Cox is excited to be here and be a part of uh, this series. Um, I just want to read a little disclaimer uh, from the Guam Coalition. Uh, this project was supported by grant number 2017 MUAX004, um, awarded by the Office on Violence Against Women, U.S. Department of Justice, and grants G2001, GUSDVC, awarded by the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act, Administration for Children and Families, 
U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this publication, program, exhibition are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of, the, of these find, funding agencies. Okay, um, most of you may already be familiar with using Zoom, but I will do just a quick run through um, of some of the features. So um, as most of you know, and have already been using, we have the text chat. Um, so feel free to use this to write any of your questions, your reactions, as well as responses to some text chat questions we, we may have. Um, if you have just joined, please introduce yourself, uh, your pronouns, um, and the organization that you're from. Um, the PowerPoint slides will be made available later, um, I believe on the Guam Coalition's website, which is guamcoalition.org. Um, and so you will access that there and I believe Taylor will probably give you the login page information. Um, we do have one polling question for today. So as we um, begin to do that poll, it'll appear on your screen and then you're able to participate in the poll from your device. Um, for those of you who maybe couldn't connect via audio phone or if you're having any Wi-Fi or internet issues, um, please do dial in by phone. Uh, those phone numbers should have been available in the registration confirmation email you received. Um, we also have closed captioning available. So definitely click on the CC or closed captioning button on the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, it'll be next to your chat and participant list. Um, and thank you to our partners at Aberdeen Captioning for helping us with this. Okay, and then we have a few breakout room sessions. Um, so we'll break for the breakout rooms, um, give a few minutes and allow participants to unmute themselves um, and discuss the breakout room topics. And then we'll return to the main group. Thank you for your patience. Okay, upcoming web conferences. So these um, are the last, or a few of the um, web conferences from this series in this month of November. Um, so definitely look out for any announcements that you may receive uh, from the Guam Coalition. Um, these are all upcoming. And I know that for those of you who might want uh, the CEU credits, um, you would have to attend all of the sessions in the month of November to receive those. Okay, so again, my name is Shelby Phillips, um, pronoun she, her. I am the Program and Communications Coordinator at Call Casa. Um, I have been with the organization for about three years now, um, and I'm happy to be here on today's session with you all. I'm just providing some housekeeping, um, being here for any tech issues that might arise, um, and also just as a point person, if you have any questions or if you want to um, say anything on the, today's session. Okay, so at this time, I'd like to pass over the virtual mic uh, to our presenter, Janet Neely, um, and I'll allow her to give a few words about um, her work and, and what she does for Cal Casa. Thank you, Shelby. Good morning, Guam. This is so exciting to actually be in Guam this morning. I wish it were true. <laughs> Um, so I'm a legal consultant with CalCASA, and I have been since I retired about a year and a half ago from the California Attorney General's office. Um, my area of expertise at the AG's office was criminal appeals, writs, and trials, and um, I specialized in sexual assault, sex offender registration, domestic violence issues. So um, the topic we're on today, restorative justice, is kind of an offshoot, uh, a, a new exploration, kind of moving past the criminal law into a whole new um, area of possibilities that it's going to be fun to explore with you today. So the learning objectives are pretty straightforward, just going to learn about different people's ideas and thoughts about restorative justice, 
a little bit about the origin and where it came from, um, how this could work in an educational campus context, and also how the interplay would work with the new Title IX regulations, um, as well as uh, some thoughts about its use in the workplace. So uh, we'll just uh, dive right in if everybody is ready. Um, with a little legal disclaimer that we are, are not offering legal advice today. If you have specific legal questions, you'll need to consult your own attorney, but I can talk in general about what the law is and um, what it says, because that's not giving you legal advice. So it's a, it's a fine line. Okay, so. Well, I'm sure you already know what the problem is um, and what we're looking for a solution to. And that is the fact that both campus sexual misconduct as well as just sexual misconduct in general, the prevalence is just a lot higher than a lot of the general public understand or believe. So five years ago, I was invited to speak at a conference of the California uh, college and university police chiefs association. And I was talking about this topic, campus sexual assault, and the chiefs were asking me, you know, did I really think that the statistics, the statistics could be accurate, that they just had a really hard time believing that one in four or one in five college women experience sexual assault during their college years. So I think that that's not an uncommon reaction by people um, who are not in our field. They don't really believe the prevalence and they're searching for, for ways that would be self-protective of the, their worldview or their loved ones to not view it as the problem that it is. Um, and you know the statistics on false reporting kind of support that thought that people are trying to grapple with the thought that it's as widespread as it is and so they don't want to believe it so hence the myth that uh you know a big big proportion of reported sexual assaults are due to false reporting when we in the field know that in fact it's you know two percent is, is probably the closest uh, statistic to what's accurate in terms of how many reports are actually false. So again, um, understanding the effects of trauma and how they play into this, we understand it because it's our field, but for a lot of other people, trying to integrate trauma-informed practices into social responses and institutional responses is something that a lot of places are just now starting to grapple with. Um, and in some ways we've gone backwards. So if you've looked at the new Title IX regulations, you'll know that today um, under those new regulations, instead of a a hearing that's required to be fair to both sides, we've moved on to having something that looks a lot like a mock trial in the campus context, um, which hasn't necessarily done anything to improve um, a trauma-informed way of addressing the issue. So you probably already know only 13% of victims of campus rapes make any kind of report, whether to the campus or law enforcement. And half of those uh, people who are survivors of campus sexual assault don't tell anyone. The big problem, of course, is that the way systems respond to reports of sexual assault or sexual har harassment play a big part in deterring disclosure. Um, too often, survivors perceive the systems as being too inflexible to meet their needs, um, that it won't care. The, the feeling is that they won't care if I do report it or they won't be fair to me if I do report it. Um, so that's why we're starting to look at whether alternative remedies and alternative systems might not um, be better, not only for uh, people who are responsible for sexual assault, but actually for the survivors and whether in some cases, at least, it might not work better for both sides. Um, Will it make survivors feel more heard 
will it provide the community with enough safety to feel confident in using an alternative system? And will it have some impact on lessening the chance of repeat offending? Those are the real issues, right? We've got to not just make both the survivor and the responsible party feel like their issues uh, were fairly addressed, but we've got to assure the community that they'll be safe um, in whatever we choose to do to respond to what's reported in this system. So the current criminal justice system really reinforces denial. People are expected to plead guilty. It's just a matter of course that if you're charged with a sexual assault, you are going to come in denying it, plead guilty. That's what any attorney is gonna tell their client. So it's set up to be adversarial. Um, a not guilty plea, everybody's going to enter one. And that, that supports the kinds of cognitive distortions that you hear um, from offenders to justify their own behavior. So, well, you know, she didn't say no, or she didn't resist, or I could tell she wanted it, or she was asking for it. Those kind of cognitive distortions that really have to be addressed in sex offender specific therapy later on um, are really supported by the adversarial situation that most sex offenders are going to experience when they are charged with a sex offense. Um, so those emphases, uh, emphases on punishment and retribution can be disincentives um, to offenders later on to even participate in treatment programs. And I, I have ex as an example, um, the California system for dealing with sexually violent predators, which is the most serious level of sex offender. It's a repeat sex offender who's committed um, really heinous and serious sex acts on multiple victims, they're sent to um, a, a secure state hospital in California. And 75%, even though they have a state-of-the-art treatment therapy system there, 75% of the um, people who are sent to that state hospital as sexually violent predators don't participate in treatment. Why not? Because their attorneys tell them they might say something that could be later used against them at a release hearing, so they just don't participate. So the confrontational aspect of the current system not just discourages reporting, but it's also going to um, have an impact on whether people are even willing to participate later in therapy. The other reason to consider restorative justice is that most criminal cases, even when they are reported, and remember it's a tiny, tiny sliver that are, are going to be reported, and it's mostly stranger sexual assault that is reported, um, those are never gonna make it to trial. Only 13% of cases that are reported will make it ultimately to trial in uh, a sexual assault cases. So it really cuts off that search for an acknowledgement of harm, some kind of uh, response that the survivor is looking for to they're going through all this to, to be able to um, have some kind of redress for what happened to them. So the current system doesn't really give a voice to survivors. They don't really have any input into the consequences that are imposed. And as a result, um, there's got to be some other alternatives that would be that would be seen as maybe better in a lot of cases for resolving these kinds of cases. The origins of restorative justice um, actually came from native peoples in Hawaii, in Canada, New Zealand, in Sierra Leone, and probably other places. Um, so what those native peoples learned was that they had to, to have consequences, but those had to be accompanied by not only an acknowledgement of harm by the perpetrator, but forgiveness, tolerance, and mercy by the people with whom that person would have to live in future. When incarceration is the only alternative, that may perpetuate intergenerational abuse cycles. So when it's family sexual assault that we're talking about, when going to prison is the only choice, people are not gonna report. And that's just a fact, that's true everywhere. 
So use of the old systems of dealing with it <clears throat> within the community rather than an outside system, promoted accountability and reduced recidivism. And it may be that today um, that will still be the case. There was one group of indigenous people in Canada, <clears throat> the Ojibwe of hollow water, who found that when they started um, using a restorative justice model instead of um, reporting to the local police, they found that it, it began to break that intergenerational cycle of abuse. Breaking the silence broke that cycle of violence and promoted accountability and healing um, within their community. And there's been a, a follow-up of that that found that in fact, um, recidivism rates were really low when they were dealt with. So it doesn't mean that there weren't consequences for the behavior because there were serious uh, consequences, but um, once they followed through with the sanctions that they agreed, and that means the survivor and the perpetrator, as well as the community agreed were necessary and appropriate, they found recidivism rates were really low. Only 2% of offenders who were dealt with within this system, the Ojibwe design, had reoffended 10 years later. So the goal of restorative justice is um, not forgiveness. Um, survivor who wants to participate in the system is doing it for himself or herself, not for other people. Um, they're saying, you're not important enough to have a stranglehold on me. You don't get to trap me in the past. And my future doesn't depend on your response. So the key really is a just outcome. Doesn't mean that forgiveness may not happen along the way that may occur. It may not occur, um, but that's not the whole point um, in the first place. Uh, putting the survivor's needs first is really the goal of restorative justice and then addressing the needs of the larger community through accountability and reducing recidivism is really key. So I'm also hoping that today, the influences of black Americans and female legislators and, and maybe other ethnic groups in our society um, may have an impact on establishing some kind of restorative justice model that their policymaking and their involvement in policymaking may give some, some um, impetus to the trend of considering alternative solutions to incarceration in some cases. Um, the, the diversification of the US and the closing of the gender gap in the political arena may be helping with the construction of justice policy that is less patriarchal um, and more egalitarian. So we'll see, but uh, that's the, the goal of restorative justice. It's a multifaceted paradigm with the ability to unite and hold together um, a, a variety of faces of justice. So what do survivors want? I think that if, since you're working in the field, you already know, but the research says that survivors usually want to have a voice in what happens after they are sexually assaulted. They are seeking validation if they report, whether it's to a friend or to a system. They're seeking vindication and they want to see offender accountability. They want someone to take responsibility for what happened because it was not their fault. So they're looking for appropriate sanctions and consequences. Um, even when we're using alternative ways to address sexual harm, the consequences are essential, but that doesn't mean it has to be necessarily what we think of as punishment today. And it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be imprisonment. Okay, Shelby, are you able to do the poll? Shelby? Ah, there we go. So we're taking a poll, just your off the cuff thoughts about how many survivors will be open to using restorative justice instead of the criminal justice system for sexual assaults.
So it looks like maybe uh, half of you think that, well, there's 50-50 chance that survivors will be interested in using it. Um, and about half of you, well, 25% of you, let's see, which is almost half of the audience, think there's a 25% chance that. So there's a lot of doubt about whether survivors will in fact want to use this kind of system. And, and that sounds like healthy, healthy doubt to me. Um, I think that as you learn more about the system, um, this poll could change. I don't know, maybe we should put it again at the end next time we do it, Shelby. Um, because I'm, I'm wondering if once you learn more about how it works, whether your opinions will change. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, I think that for sure, the research shows that survivors who survive an attack by a stranger are not going to want to use a restorative justice approach. Um, survivors, the vast majority, if they make a report, are going to want to make a report within the criminal justice system. So what the research shows is that survivors who are more interested in using a restorative justice approach are people who either knew their uh, harasser or attacker, um, either in an acquaintance or friendship situation or dating relationship or you know, intimate partner situation. Um, and it's people who have to live in some way with the perpetrator in the future, um, whether that means on campus or as part of a family or in, a, in some other form of relationship that's going to be ongoing. So I think that that makes a big difference. Okay, so Shelby, I, I can't advance the slide. So I think uh, you've got to do something. Huh, okay. All right, so there's, there's various ways that um, restorative justice is already being used in a variety of settings in the United States. Um, there's some jurisdictions that have criminal justice system alternatives that I'm gonna talk about. They're not necessarily a true restorative justice paradigm, but they are quasi restorative justice. Some campuses, actually quite a few, um, campuses with higher education and some K through 12 are using restorative justice systems. And um, there's less evidence that there's, this is going on a lot in the workplace, but there is some evidence that it's happening some places. So we'll talk about those. So the basics of any restorative justice system are that there is some kind of acknowledgement of the harm caused by the perpetrator. So unless whoever, uh, the, res the responsible party, unless they are willing to come in at the outset and admit that they caused the harm, then restorative justice doesn't work. So that's number one. Um, number two is that a true restorative justice system means both parties agree to engage in this alternative system, whether it's an alternative to a Title IX hearing on a college campus, or whether it's some kind of alternative within the criminal justice system. Um, not every restorative justice proceeding is going to include a face-to-face -face meeting between the survivor and the perpetrator. That is up to the survivor, and it is not a necessary component of restorative justice. It may happen, often does happen, but it doesn't have to happen. Finally, the, the other basic requirement of restorative justice is that there's a commitment, um, not just by the parties to participate, but by the community that they're in to follow through with the sanctions that are mutually agreed on. And by mutually agreed, I mean not only the survivor and the responsible party, but the community that they are within, whether it's a college campus or whether it's uh, a larger society. So we're gonna turn first to the criminal justice system and look at how it can be used as a model within criminal justice. 
One model that I've seen is called a dual opt-in system. So it would require that the, the state or jurisdiction's penal code have criteria for using this alternative therapeutic justice, justice or um, restorative justice model. Again, for it to be truly a dual opt-in system, both parties have to agree, both the um, survivor and the responsible party. And up front, there still has to be an acknowledgement of responsibility for the crime. So going into it, everybody knows that this person admits that they did what they're alleged to have done. At that point, there's either a use of diversion or suspended sentences if the um, perpetrator follows through with his uh, commitment to participate in the system. And there is a requirement of a specific type of treatment that's gonna be tailored to what happened and to this particular offender. And there's various options. So California, and I'm sorry, I don't know about whether you have a diversion system in Guam, um, so I can only tell you what we've got here in California, which is pretty typical in the US. And that is that we don't have a true dual opt-in system in California. What we have is a diversion system in which the district attorney in the county decides whether or not they're going to offer diversion for certain offenses. It's not used very much for sexual offenses, in fact, rarely. Um, unless we're talking about indecent exposure, which in some jurisdictions in California, a lot of people who commit indecent exposure offenses are offered diversion. Um, and if you successfully complete the probationary period that accompanies diversion, then you're, you're going to be able to uh, possibly escape having your name added to the sex offender registry which is a big deal. Um, certainly in California, I'm sure it's a big deal everywhere um, because there's a lot of things that go along with that that um, we can talk about. So the reason I think that it's not used more often is that most people don't really know the statistics on sexual offending. And in the mind of the general public, once a sex offender, always a sex offender. If you've done it once, you're going to do it again. In fact, you know the research shows that's not true at all. And there's a robust body of research over the last 25 years showing that in fact, for most sex offenders, the interruption of that offending cycle by a serious sanction and being called on your behavior means that it doesn't happen again so that the majority of sex offenders do not repeat the same offense twice. However, of course, there's, there's a, a range and it runs from low risk offenders all the way up through people who have a very high risk of repeating the offense. And so one of the keys to deciding who to allow the option to participate in a restorative justice model is figuring out what is the risk level of the person that you're dealing with. Because if they're going to be at high risk of reoffending, no matter what model they, that you use, you may want to make sure they go to prison. Whereas if they're in the moderate to low risk range of reoffending, once they've been sanctioned for their conduct that they got caught for, then they may be a much better candidate to offer this to. So in California, I think that the understanding, at least within the criminal justice system, police and sheriffs and prosecutors has evolved over the last few years. They do understand that not every sex offender will repeat their offense. And they do understand that the right kind of sex offender specific treatment can have a role in making sure that these offenders don't reoffend. But I think that there's still a ways to go. Um, and so that's one reason why diversion or other forms of restorative justice may still be a reach for some, some jurisdictions to wrap their heads around. <coughs> now I talked to um, a, a sex offender treatment provider in Washington state who told me about a model they had successfully used for a number of years in Washington state. 
What they did there was they selected probation officers and trained them to be diversion counselors. Um, so gave them, you know, probably training on how to be trauma informed for one thing, um, because you're gonna be dealing with trauma both with the survivor and with the perpetrator a lot of the time. <coughs> and they um, did pre-sentence evaluations so that they would have the, the risk level or at least a guess. I mean, and now we can make today much better than 25 years ago when this model was being used. In fact, we have really good risk assessment tools that we can use to assess the risk level of the offender that we're dealing with. They also did a psychosexual evaluation, which, which is really not as good as an empirical sex, sex offender risk assessment tool, but that's all they pretty much had back then. So that's what they were using in lieu of sex offender risk assessment tools. And then the DA would make an offer to the people that met these prerequisites, okay? So they weren't high risk, they were found eligible for the diversion program, and the offer was this. Your arrest and your fingerprints will stay in the system, but we will not further process your case if you sign a written admission regarding your conduct and an agreement to sex offender specific treatment um, and that's going to be for at least three years. You'll be monitored by the diversion counselors, the probation officers. If you successfully complete the three years, charges will be dropped. But if you violate, you will be prosecuted and your signed confession that you're giving us as part of this program will be used against you. <coughs> that actually worked really well. In Washington, I asked what, why they stopped doing it. And the treatment provider told me it was because in the mid nineties, um, when the Adam Walsh Act was sweeping the nation, um, little Adam Walsh was, was kidnapped um, and his, his body was not found until recently in the last year or two. So he was missing for almost 30 years and his family didn't know what happened to him. And they started, um, well, they found it was very difficult for police to contact nearby sex offenders with similar offenses because they didn't have a sex offender registry. So what they did was they got national legislation requiring all states to enact sex offender registries to make it easier for police in missing children cases to interview nearby people with similar MOs. But um, because all that was going on, the Adam Walsh Act and states being required to um, establish registries if they didn't already have one, the political climate changed. Sex offenders became more the, uh, you know, the, the, the people that nobody had any sympathy for, not that they have, we have more sympathy offenders today than we did then, but it wasn't in fashion anymore to offer diversion to people who had committed these these kinds of offenses, regardless of the risk level of the offender or the egregiousness of the offense, they simply dropped the program. So today we know a lot more than we did 25 years ago about chances of rehabilitation. <clears throat> it's pretty clear at this point that prison is unlikely to increase the likelihood of rehabilitation for anybody. And I don't know about Guam and what you have available um, for people who are imprisoned, but in California, we really don't have any uh, good system of sex offender treatment while you're in prison. Our sex offender specific mandated treatment programs occur after people get out of prison. So it could be argued that the time they're spending in prison is, is, not, is probably detracting from the treatment that they're going to eventually get when they get out in the public. Um, restorative justice, the idea is to combine account accountability with these steps toward change that are part of a targeted therapy approach. So targeted therapy would be a partnership between criminal justice professionals, meaning probation and parole officers, and sex offender treatment providers. And that's, that's what we're doing here in California once they are released from prison. But again, we've got to consider public safety and risk level of the offender and deciding who, who gets to par participate. It is true though that if the approach, the approach used um, 
allows room for empathy or inclusion instead of isolating and shaming the person who has sexually committed uh, an offense, you're going to have a better chance for rehabilitation, even for a lower risk offender. It's just what the research shows. All right, so I'm gonna show you um, this video. Let's see if I can bring it up. It's just a clip from one restorative justice program. So I'm not seeing it here, Shelby. I think I'm gonna to have to. Okay, so let me see if it's keyed up. So I gotta, hold on a minute, you guys. I gotta key it up. A crime. I had it here, but I don't know what happened to it. Okay. So this is just one, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say while we're waiting for the video to load, there is a question in a chat. Okay. Um, so they asked if there's any statistics of any offenders who successfully rehabilitated from this. So after, sure. after using the restorative justice? I'm assuming that's what they mean. Um, uh, through a restorative justice type system. Well, certainly there's there's a number of states that use diversion systems and there's plenty of successful people who, who use diversion, but I don't have in mind any particular study to quote you for that. Um, that's just my experience of 30 some years as a prosecutor speaking to that. Um, I know that in the, um, the more informal study, well, that the state of Canada did on the Ojibwe restorative justice process where they started um, dealing with sex offenses within their tribe with a restorative justice model that after 10 years, um, the research showed that they had a very low recidivism rate. Um, and there are, there are other studies. And um, if you're really interested, you know, just email me at Calcasa after it's over and I can give you what I've got on the recidivism rates. But um, there is some good, uh, there are some good studies that do show that this, this can work, that this approach can work uh, in reducing recidivism, yeah. Okay, are we ready for, I'm gonna play this video, just, uh, just about three and a half minutes. Nora came into the art room and, and just reflect on what you were thinking, what you were feeling as, as Nora was uh, sharing about Nicholas. A standpoint when I met Nora, I did not know Nicholas, I didn't know who killed Nicholas. I didn't know where Nicholas was from on a general note. Now on a, a specific note, personally, I had to go to the board. And being that I wasn't in the house during the murders, I could not connect to the act of murder and to say honestly, yes, intellectually, I can go before the board and intellectualize them and even show some great emotions, but it's not about the person that was harmed, it's about me thinking in my mind that you harmed my mama, you harmed my daddy, that you left me without one of my parents. Those tears would have not been honest because they would not have been for the victims in my case. So I confided in you and I confided in, in Chris and the bare bones brothers like, yeah, bro, I'm having a problem connecting and I don't want to go in there dishonest. I'm not going in there to put on a show. Uh, but since at no point in my life I pulled a gun on a person and killed them, that I just I couldn't connect. And so when you started to bring uh, Nora specifically in, I remember she passed around the picture. Of Nicholas, and she's telling the story. And you told me before. She even came, she said, Tobias, whatever you feel, allow the spirit to move. And so when Mother Nora started talking and we're passing the picture around the group, I'm holding the picture and I have uh, my fingers upon his heart. And Nicholas started to speak to me. And it, got, uh, and it became so overwhelming that I'm looking at my Javier, and he's shaking his head, like, like, go ahead, brother, speak your truth. And I'm resisting it. Ah. 
And then I just blurted out, no, you know, I'm the one who killed your son. Of course, I'm not the one who pulled the trigger, but I took on the mentality and the attitude that I was willing to pick up a gun and kill anybody. Because that's how broken and hurt and disconnected I was. So now you have a mother who is coming to us to make us face our shame, make us face the darkest moments. And I start speaking in the tongue of Nicholas. And we hug, kids, she's crying, I'm hugging. And that's when I got it. And when I went to the board, people don't know this, I was in there for six hours. And because I went in there, I took the murders for my co-defendants. And the commissioner asked me, was I crazy? I said, no, ma'am, I came here, I told to speak the truth, so help me God, you know, we put your hand on there. And she threatened to leave me in prison for the rest of my life if I came to take those murders knowing that I wasn't in the house. I said, man, what you have to understand <laughs> is to kill one person is to kill humanity to feed into the mentality of hostility and self-hatred and disconnection to the point that your friends will go inside of a house and murder somebody. Okay, let me try and go back to the PowerPoint. All right, so that was one uh, type of restorative justice program that actually took place obviously post-sentencing. Um, the, the mother of the victim really was the surrogate for the victim in that scenario um, because obviously the victim couldn't speak for himself. Her son had been killed by in a gang type shooting. But her being able to go in and talk directly eventually with some of the people that were involved with the murder of her son, eventually they could understand um, in a more human way the consequences of their actions and what they had done. And um, the guy who was just talking, who was the driver for the um, getaway car, um, did not get released from prison on the, at that parole hearing. But nevertheless, um, his understanding of his, his culpability and acknowledgement of that may or may not have happened um, if it hadn't been brought so clearly to, you know, to um, his understanding by talking to somebody who could share the pain of that whole thing, even though it was vicarious. Well, it wasn't vicarious in that, you know, she was in her own pain too. But in other words, it, it really made it real. Um, and that made a difference. The um, restorative justice model requires extensive training on dynamics for fa facilitators. So it's not just a therapist who starts doing individual or group therapy with the people involved in the, it's a whole structured process that starts out with, um, uh, it starts out with talking to people individually, talking to other people who were involved or impacted by what happened. And it may or may not culminate in a face-to-face -face circle or meeting with the people who were involved. Um, there has to be a credible commitment um, to working with rape crisis centers and anti-violence groups. It has to be a community involvement, not an individual kind of thing, whether it's done through criminal justice or whether it's done on campus, there needs to be involvement with people who are working in this area. Um, they're trained, of course, on listening and, and support and compassion, but um, there's no cookie cutter approach. Uh, there's, there's a number of ways to do this and a number of institutes that do the training for facilitators in these systems.
Um, often diversion you'll see used when the sexual conduct was illegal, but it wasn't forcible, meaning underage sex where the survivor agreed to participate. It's often used with family's consent when the, the responsible party is a minor. In some cultures, statutory rape isn't even a crime. It's condoned by families. So um, it can be used in conjunction sometimes with family reunification systems. So if the survivor who is participating in a restorative justice process wants to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the um, responsible party, ultimately, the survivor is involved in the choices around how will that be managed, what will it be, look like, and given control over what that is going to be like for them. Support people are always included in the process. And the facilitator is going to be working separately and thoroughly with the offender first, because that person needs to have some understanding of what responsibility is, looks, looks like and has to understand about how to listen and how to take accountability. Just because they come in and said, okay, I admit I did it, is not gonna get you to the end goal of having this person really understand that what they did was wrong. It had this impact on this other person or these other community members, as well as the survivor and what those outcomes are. So um, this, I'm not gonna click on this link here. I just put it on the slide because I thought it was a really interesting um, website about the kinds of outcomes that we can work for in restorative justice. So it'll just be on your slides if you decide to print them out. Now, in the past, we haven't really thought about using this kind of situation, restorative justice situation in domestic violence. And the, the classic you know, thinking has been that we don't want to get the person who suffered um, at the hands of a intimate partner, in, intimate partner violence, um, batterer to have to be involved directly with that person in any kind of situation. But because of the problems with the use of incarceration, um, the increased emphasis on searching for alternatives to incarceration, um, people are starting to talk about whether or not intimate partner violence might be one area where we ought to be thinking about restorative justice um, alternatives. One of the problems, as you know, with domestic violence has been an unintended criminalization, not just of the batterer, but uh, in dual arrest policies, um, states that have those find that their arrest rates for the, the survivor are going up. And that's been an unfair consequence um, in a lot, of, a lot of jurisdictions. So, the, and the other problem, of course, is reporting. I mean, if you're going to lose the person who supports the family financially, that's always a disincentive for people to report. So having an option be restorative justice, which would mean that the perpetrator wouldn't necessarily go to prison, even though the family might be separated for some time, um, may enable survivors to speak up or even to leave during the restorative justice process, um, but get some buy-in by the, by the batterer too. So I don't know, I think, I don't have an opinion one way or the other about whether this will work, but I can tell you that greater minds than mine in restorative justice field are thinking about whether or not this might be a positive, possible alternative in some situations. So I talked a little bit about this, the unintended effects on survivors after mandatory arrest policies, dual arrests. Um, the other problem, of course, is that even after criminal justice interventions, we're still seeing a lot of recidivism in domestic violence situations. Um, and a lot of jurisdictions have policies or laws that disregard the, the choices of the survivor in domestic violence cases. California is in that group. Um, 
prosecutor will try a case um, when they have the evidence to do so, even when a survivor has decided they no longer want to participate in the trial. Um, and that doesn't happen with sex assault cases because under California law, it's a choice as to whether a sexual assault survivor goes forward with a, a criminal justice prosecution, but that's not true for domestic violence. Um, and the thinking I think was that, well, so many survivors in domestic violence will recant ultimately that we just can't let them make that choice. But we need to rethink that because taking that choice away from survivors is not necessarily making them safer um, because what we're finding is recidivism is still occurring, right? So joint meetings um, could still threaten survivors safety. And so that has to be a case by case decision. But there have been rigorous studies of the use of restorative justice programs in domestic violence situation. And so here's a meta analysis that looked at a total of almost 1900 arrested or convicted domestic violence offenders. And what they found was that there was a modest but highly cost effective reduction in the frequency of repeat offending. And that's the citation down there from the Harvard uh, Journal of Law and Gender. So it's already being tried in some areas. And um, in this meta-analysis, they found while the, the improvement wasn't great, there was improvement in the recidivism uh, statistics. Restorative justice in the juvenile justice system is really uh, where we see this most commonly in teen or youth courts. Um, for quite a while, uh, quite a few jurisdictions have used community service, apology letters, counseling programs targeted at teen offenders to try and keep them out of youth prisons, basically. So in California, in Alameda County, which is the county where Oakland and Berkeley are, they have um, restorative justice programs for both female and male ju juvenile offenders. And they have much lower recidivism, recidivism outcomes than they get when they use formal criminal justice proceedings, which result in incarceration. So using the restorative justice system, 44% of the kids were less likely to have a new sustained charge within a year. And there's the link to that study is down at the bottom of that slide. Same thing on, on higher education campuses. Um, we've been rethinking these options too for de dealing um, with domestic violence and sexual assault on campus. In colleges, just like K through 12 populations, we still have kids who are not adults yet. Their brain development hasn't stopped. So we still got the risk-taking behavior, emotional intensity, um, lower levels of problem solving, um, impulsive acts, peer influences, um, and LBTQ students who are coming to college may already have experienced other negative uh, experiences prior to getting there. So there's a real need at the college level for mental health counselors and restorative justice facilitators and they have to be trained to address these diverse social and sexual identities as well in the college population. This is happening on quite a few college campuses. I'm on a, uh, a listserv of restorative justice professionals throughout the, the United States. And I was amazed to find out how widespread this movement is on college campuses. So David Karp, who uh, is one of the big, uh, I don't know what, whether to say founders, but he's definitely one of the, the experts um, propelling this movement. And David's a lovely person. I had the fortune to be in a, a seminar with him uh, last December. He has written a book called The Little Book of Restorative Justice for Colleges and Universities. And I really encourage you to get that if you're um, doing um, anything with sexual assault on campuses. So, the four keys he says are inclusive decision-making, active accountability, meaning that the person who was responsible is going to have to be involved in figuring out how they can account and make up for what they've done. Repairing harm, there has to be a way of 
of making up what happened to the survivor and to the community members who had harmed and then rebuilding trust. So those are the four keys. In a campus restorative justice system, just like it should be in criminal justice, the focus is not the offending party, it's on the harm they created and what we should do about it. So the survivor has a big role in articulating the harm they experienced. They may not do that directly face-to-face -face with the perpetrator or they may, but they'll be able to articulate it to the, the facilitator of the process. And that person will be able to share it with um, the responsible party. So in these, in these situations, the offenders are not spectators at their own trials. They're not just sitting there while an attorney does all the work for them. They're made to uh, speak and help figure out what is the most effective way to prevent them from doing this again and to make up for the harm that they have caused. So active responsibility, commitment to fully engage with the aim of making amends, and sanctions that are developed with active engagement by the offender means it is more likely that they'll actually follow through with the requirements. And I think that that makes sense because if you're involved and agree that certain sanctions or uh, consequences are fair, you're more likely to comply. I think that you're less likely to view it as a coercive process. And while you may not be happy about it, you're more likely to do it. So. Here's the scenario. Um, Shelby is going to type this scenario into the chat box so you can see it while you're talking in your breakout rooms. Um, but the scenario is that we have a drunken student, college student, who's climbing into his girlfriend's car and he refuses to get out of it. She drives to the nearest police station and then it takes several police officers who have to come out of the station to pry this guy out of her car. However, this is the first time he's ever been violent with her or exhibited any kind of stalking behavior until now. So what I'd like you to discuss in your breakouts is, should criminal charges be filed here? And if so, should he be expelled? Is this the kind of situation you think a restorative justice process could be used in that might allow this guy to remain on campus? And what might influence your decision? on whether to offer a restorative justice alternative or not. So take about five minutes to talk about this in your breakout groups, and then we'll come back and we'll just ask each breakout room to give us a quick um, synopsis of what they, they've made of it. Okay, Shelby?
Oh, are we back yet? Uh, rooms are closing in two seconds. Okay, and then can you unmute everybody for a little bit? Yes. Okay, so we can have a discussion. I can, I don't see any way for me to do it. Um, I think it's under participants. Uh, okay. Well, mine says mute all, so it just looks like they aren't muted right now. Ain't gonna hurt. Okay. So is everybody back? Yes. Okay. All right. So. Um, I'd like, you know, let's see there, we've got 67 people, so we should have had, how many were in a breakout room, Shelby? Um, there were six to seven. Okay, so we probably got 10 breakout rooms, so we don't have time to do all 10, but could two or three um, different breakouts just uh, offer me some of the answers that their group uh, came up with or thought, their thoughts? If we were in a circle, I'd kind of drag you into the middle but I can't, <laughs> so, and I'm gonna depend on volunteers. Uh, this is Taylor from the coalition. I was in room six. I'm happy to discuss what Great. we, okay. Um, so we don't believe charges should be filed or that he should be expelled at this time. Um, this is like his first, his first incident that we know of. Um, so we would check in with um, his girlfriend. We want to hear like both sides kind of get like the backstory. Um, because he is on a college campus, we think they have a little bit more room to require counseling and like alcohol classes. Um, of course, following like the college campus policies. And then we want to make sure that resources are also offered to his girlfriend um, and make sure she's okay. Um, not sure if there's like a, an investigation, like a, a pre-trial or pre-investigation um, on like his, rem his remorse or anything that they can measure to see if it would be um, amenable for both parties and be um, actually restorative for them. Okay. All right. That's great. So you, your group was willing to at least explore um, allowing restorative justice to be used for this situation, right? Yeah, I think we we're leaning more towards that situation based on um, the use of alcohol and that this was his first uh -huh. okay. um, offense. Great. Um, is there another breakout room that would like to speak about their thoughts? <clears throat> Come on, you guys. Just one more. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, this is Margaret. I'm with um, group seven. So um, it doesn't really say in the scenario if this was on a, at a work site area, but with, with the agency that I'm with, with the Department of Education, you know, we have the tolerance of the um, no smoking and alcohol on premises. Now, if this individual was on campus as a drunken person, and this was an employee that, um, that let's say the female was the employee, um, being on campus like that drunken, we should be able to remove that only because um, in the, uh, the K to 12 area, you know, you do have minors in the presence of the area. So the safety factor is what we're going to be looking at. Mm -hmm. And so it would be up to the girlfriend there or the girl there if she's willing to file a formal complaint with GPD um, because of the situation and the department may look at filing separately because there was a violation based on the fact that we do have that toler no, the zero tolerance of um, smoking and drunk within the area. So nobody should be actually on campus in that type of um state. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as expelled, um, if he's not an employee of ours, then 
and um, he did enter within the premises, and that's beyond our area because he's not an employee. However, if he is, then there is the um, uh, disciplinary action that we have, as we call it a progressive discipline action taken if this was the first time and he presented that, he may look at being placed on a um, uh, some kind of alcohol uh, class as well as um, being possibly um, a progressive discipline may be taken against him. Um, could be a reprimand or a memor memorandum of warning. And should the incident occur again, then that would be going up the channel. However, because of him being uh, refusing to get out of a vehicle, again, that's possibly on the female's part if she wants to file an official complaint based on that situation. And that's just my personal opinion. Sure. So that's how it would work under the, the system that you have now, it sounds like, right? Um, but what did your group feel about if there was an alternative system that was a facilitated restorative justice process, would you have been willing to um, let the two parties participate with that along with any other community? We, we didn't quite, um, we didn't quite discuss that more, but uh, we also looking at addressing that um, Probably there needs to be a little bit more information as to the situation, but given the fact that this is his first time, uh -huh. again, um, we still need to take a look at because remember, safety is a paramount thing there, you know, with the sure. others around. Sure. And if what if he he may be drunk, but what if he had a weapon with him there? Could that threaten or jeopardize her safety while in a sure. vehicle? Sure. You know. Yeah. Um, otherwise, she should have just gotten out of the vehicle and just let him sit in there and take off and get uh, help elsewhere. Yeah. You know, yeah, she took her, yeah, for sure. She took a risk driving to the police station. Yes, yeah, she um, did. She did. Yeah, she totally did. OK, thank you for sharing that. Um, so Shelby, go ahead and mute the room again, because um, it's just easier for people to hear. And then I'll talk a little bit. So this actually was a real life situation that occurred on a college campus that David what so I'm muted hold on so if, can you hear me still you guys we can hear you now okay thanks all right so what happened um, was that the campus where this occurred um, did have a restorative justice system. And what the restorative justice facilitator did was try to involve other people who were impacted, not just the survivor, the, the girl who was being stalked and whose car he refused to get out of. And so involved in the process were also the police officers that had to forcibly remove him from her car when she drove to the police station. Um, they were really skeptical about letting the offender stay on campus. Um, but as part of the, the restorative justice process where everybody discussed, well, if we're going to let you stay on campus, then what kinds of things can you do to make sure that this will never happen again? They agreed that the student would do um, specific counseling to address his anger issues, his relationship uh, issues, and his substance abuse issues. And he also agreed to work with the police officers to present a campus workshop on the legal consequences of alcohol abuse. So the, the campus allowed him to use the restorative justice process because the, the girlfriend, the survivor, was willing to go that route. And um, ultimately, it worked out that they were um, everybody was satisfied with what the consequences were. So um, again, this is taken from David Karp's book on restorative justice on campus. So there, there are challenges to um, getting campuses to agree to use an alternative system to Title IX, although the new Title IX regulations do expressly permit campuses to use restorative justice as an alternative to a Title IX disciplinary hearing. Um, but the reason campuses often hesitate have to do with liability. 
They're worried about um, whether they'll be sued if they go in this direction. I don't know that there's any indication from what's happened on the multiple campuses that are using the system that they get sued more or less often. I'm not aware of any research on that. I think liability myself is, is something that general counsel for campuses worry about all the time, but I personally don't see why they'd be more liable using a facilitated process than the Title IX process. Um, other challenges are confidentiality. Um, even though the facilitator is going to com completely keep the process and the people that they talk to to determine what happened and how to proceed confidential, those, um, those rules about confidentiality are within the system and people have to agree to them. So there need to be uh, ways to work that out in advance. Um, there's often a pressure for a campus to expel somebody who's committed, a, especially in any kind of active sexual assault. And if they do suspend someone instead of expelling them outright, so they, they send them away for one or two semesters or even a couple of years, um, there can be a lack of resources during those suspension periods, meaning the person can be ordered to do sex offender specific counseling or anger management counseling or alcohol treatment, but it, they're on their own to fund it if they're no longer a, a student at that campus. And they may not have the resources to obtain that kind of specific counseling or treatment um, while they're no longer at the school. So that's one problem. Another challenge is the cost of training facilitators to do this because again, you have to have not just mental health counselors, but people who are specifically trained in how to do restorative justice facilitation. Um, and if counseling is going to be an outcome and it's going to be, let's say, sex offender specific treatment, you can't just have generalists who know how to do mental health treatment at the campus uh, you know, counseling center. You have to have people who have experience and training in how to do sex offender specific treatment. And that's a lack that most campuses are going to have. So those are the barriers. Um, it doesn't mean it can't be done, but those are challenges that campuses have to figure out ways to overcome. Um, at the University of San Diego, which is a Catholic university in California and which is where I met David Karp at the Center for Restorative Justice, um, they showed us this model that they use. So facilitators will start with um, building and strengthening relationships on the campus. In other words, the different parts of the campus are gonna have to work together. Housing is gonna have to work together with faculty who are gonna have to work together with administrators who are gonna have to work together with all the other you know, parts of the campus that can come together to impact what could happen to the survivor for accommodations and what can happen with the consequences to the perpetrator, right? And the next tier then is for restorative justice to start building responses to conflict and harm. What are those going to look like? What are typical accountability uh, or sanctions going to be? How are you going to involve people in the campus and outside communities like the police who were involved in that last incident in the facilitation of the offenses? And finally, how are you gonna support re-entry? So let's say that somebody is sent away for a semester or longer. How are you going to support their re-entry to, to try and minimize any possibility of reoffense occurring. That is the, those are the stages that a campus would have to go through. When you have a restorative response to misconduct, what the facilitator does is um, first do the intake and pre-conference interviews with everybody who was involved, you know, whether it's the survivor, the admitting responsible party others who saw or were involved or impacted by the behavior that occurred. And then let them tell their stories. Let them tell the facilitator what happened um, from their point of view and then help list the harms um, so that they, they understand 
the extent of what happened to um, the other person. And then everybody is involved eventually in brainstorming the solutions and in uh, reaching an agreement on what the accountability is gonna be. And then there has to be some campus involvement in the mentoring, um, making sure that the person follows through with whatever the agreement is. So here's another hypothetical. Um, and this is another campus example. We have a student on campus who has an air gun and he brandishes it at another student when he's angry and threatens him with it. So bystanders who saw this happening thought it was real, thought it was a real gun, including a group of international students. A campus security officer responded to the scene, was able to defuse the situation and figured out the gun wasn't real. So the student agreed then to participate in a restorative justice process on that campus. So we're gonna do a short breakout um, on this one too, um, but what we're gonna look at is who should the restorative justice facilitator be talking to in this situation about the harms that were caused, whose story needs to be told when everybody's gathered together in a circle eventually to talk about it. Um, to move this out of my way so I can read it. Assume those involved are given a chance to explain their stories and experience, brainstorm possible solutions and consequences for this, um, this incident, okay? So Shelby's gonna put, again, this in the chat box, who should they talk to, whose story needs to be told, assume everybody will have a chance to explain and then come up with some possible consequences and solutions. And we'll take about five minutes again. So let me know when everybody's back, Shelby. Okay. I have about 30 seconds until all the rooms close. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Are we, are we all back? Yep, everyone's back. Okay. All right, so um, are they unmuted, Shelby? No, I can mute, unmute everyone. Wait, unmute them for a minute. Okay. So it sounds like one group hasn't stopped. 
So is there is there any group who wants to talk about what their group thought would be the possible harms here and things that need to be addressed? Well, if it's if, if no one wants to address it, we can just look at how what they did with this actual incident. Um, why don't you go ahead and mute it, Shelby, and I'll just talk about what, what actually happened with this, because this actually did happen on the campus. Um, so the harms that, that the facilitator in this restorative justice. Kaplan and Marie. OK. So can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. OK, thanks. Um, the harms that they identified in this particular restorative justice facilitated event were obviously individual harms. The student who was threatened with the gun obviously was harmed, was afraid for his life. But also the students who observed the incident, the, especially the international students, um, were felt harmed as a, as a community. You know, they started worrying about would they be involved if there, there was some kind of prosecution for this incident, would they, um, you know, have to testify or go down and talk to the police? It stirred up a lot of anxiety among the international students who were spectators at this uh, event. And then obviously there were broader harms as well about safety of the campus community um, United States gun violence and what can be done about it, uh, especially, you know, in, a, in the smaller space of within the bounds of a campus. And what was needed, of course, was some kind of acknowledgement of the fear and harm that was caused, um, a feeling of, of safety that needed to come probably from the campus, but maybe also individually from the offender to the groups uh, that were harmed and that were placed in fear. And what they ultimately came up with after they had this facilitation where um, everybody who suffered harm from this incident got a chance to share what it was like for them and how scary it was for them um, was that the, uh, the offending party with the air gun apologized to everyone um, and agreed to uh, put up um, to, to participate in educational workshops to deal with gun safety. And also he agreed to um, participate in the gun safety campaign for the entire campus. So he wasn't expelled because it wasn't a real gun, but he, he had a lot of uh, accountability to do in addition to the apologies that he um, gave to those. I'm sorry. I thought maybe there was a question. Okay, so anyway, that's how it was dealt with on the campus where, where this occurred. Moving on. So now I'm gonna talk just a little bit about K through 12 schools and restorative justice. Um, restorative justice has been used um, quite effectively in K through 12 schools. And they've used community conferencing as the technique that they um, use to address the conflicts that occur between individuals or student groups or staff. And they bring in not just those involved in the conflict itself, but family members or, or support people for those who are involved. So this happened in the schools in Baltimore and um, Baltimore's pioneering approach actually has been copied in, in other jurisdictions because what they did was they trained facilitators using this community conferencing technique um, to include you know, the broader community of the families and beyond and gave the participants the, the option or the opportunity to discuss what happened, um, how they were affected and then brainstorming all together ways to repair the harm so that it didn't happen again. So what's impressive about Baltimore's system is that over 95% of the community conferences that they have held in Baltimore schools 
have resulted in a written agreement among the parties. Um, and there's been over 95% compliance with the written agreement. So that's, that's pretty amazing. The other thing about the Baltimore experiment was that the vast majority of um, kids that were involved in this restorative justice system were minority kids. So 97% um, were, were minority, but it provided these youth um, of various ethnicities, ethnicities, the same alternatives that often are made only available to Caucasian kids. In other words, a way to avoid the criminal justice system, the juvenile justice system, and to deal with it in a different way. And it's worked really well. So in the meetings that they have, um, they, they just do it just like any normal restorative justice system, except that family members are involved because it's high school and younger students. And if you want to learn more about how they do it in Baltimore, the, I put the link to the website that talks about the success of this program um, on this slide. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about workplace harassment and sexual violence. Um, there's not nearly as much written about the use of restorative justice for workplace harassment or nearly as much um, study about the effectiveness of restorative justice situations because understandably um, personnel departments really discourage this. People don't want to acknowledge sexual harassment or sexual violence in the workplace because they're afraid it will follow them to their next job. And it's really hard to persuade employers to agree to use these kinds of systems because they would rather just fire somebody. It's, it's easier, it's quicker, and they are worried about, about liability, just like campus counsel are worried about being sued. So, the, you know, the typical HR response when somebody asks for a reference nowadays is to give only the dates of employment for the person that is being inquired about. But the problem in sexual assault, of course, is that's really playing into the hands of the harasser, right? Because it's passing the harasser onto a new employer who has no idea of what went before. And that really is not in the best interest of survivors or people who may become victims themselves next. So sexual harassment in the workplace isn't necessarily motivated by sexual desire. Um, it can still be discriminatory regardless of what the motivation for it is. It's really often more about upholding a gendered status um, power and control, right, and identity than sexual desire. Um, according to this United States Supreme Court case, uh, it provides a way for some men to monop monopolize women um, and win the prized roles and maintain a, a feeling of masculine superiority. That's how the Supreme Court put it in the Oncala case. So how do we address employers' fears and persuades at least sometimes that persuade them that restorative justice might be a better option. Well, executives and boards of companies are starting to look at harassment the same way that they think about other risks to their companies like security, like hacking, um, about reputational harm, right? Because it's not really, we're not talking about a slap on the wrist. We're talking about making sure that people are accountable in ways that matter, matter to the company, matter to the society that they're in, matter to the survivor. Um, so let's see if I can move this thing off of my words. Yeah, so one of the proponents of restorative justice has said that there's no educational workshop or other sanction that can duplicate sitting in front of the person you have harmed and hearing how it affected them. That's much more difficult than just showing up at a workshop that you're assigned to appear at. And, and I, I think that makes sense. The other thing that employers are starting to realize is that restorative justice may reduce their chance of being sued by one party or the other because restorative justice only operates if it's chosen by the survivor, right? Both parties have to agree to participate. So research shows that the harmed parties, the survivors consistently appreciated 
the opportunity when there was a well-structured restorative justice process because they believed they got a voice that way in what happened and they got to feel like the person was made to be accountable, not just dismissed who went on to maybe even a better job somewhere else. So because offenders have to take responsibility after the talking about the harms, if everybody believes the process and the outcomes are fair, the company is less likely to be sued by one party or the other. Um, survivors feel like they really are able to move on with their life and the process becomes a win-win um, for everybody, not just the survivor. So it does have a really good upside. It's just convincing employers that it has an upside. So here's a really good example of how it can work. And you may have heard of this case. This is a famous case in the area of restorative justice. Dalhousie is a dental school in Canada. And Canada has really pioneered some of the programs in restorative justice. So at Dalhousie, um, there was a group of women dental students who discovered that 13 of their fellow male classmates had set up a private Facebook page and it had misogynist, sexist, and homo homophobic material about them, about the women students, their classmates, posted on this private page. These women made a decision um, to choose the school's restorative justice process uh, rather than filing any kind of charges or doing any kind of whatever Canada's equivalent of Title IX is. So the facilitated process there meant that um, they, they had to go through a thorough investigation that lasted months. There were regular meetings between the facilitators and the participants, meaning the both the women and the male students. And there were different types of restorative justice circles um, over different issues with various groups. So it was a five month process and it didn't end with anybody being expelled, but the women said they were clear from the beginning that they didn't want um, their classmates simply to be expelled who would then be 13 angry men with no more understanding of what happened than they did the post, than the day the posts were uncovered. Um, they said, we didn't want to simply forgive and forget. We were looking for a, re a resolution that would allow us to graduate alongside men who then would understand the harm they caused and own those harms and carry with them the responsibility and obligation to do better in their dental practices and in their life. So um, one person has said that by the end of the process, the men actually were able to take responsibility for their actions, to understand why their actions created the reaction that they did and why they reinforced um, gender-based harm and stereotypes. Um, so the learning and change that happened with the male perpetrators in this case would not have happened had they simply been expelled. They would have gone on to schools elsewhere probably. Um, most expulsions for, for sexual assault type uh, or harassment type cases don't get recorded in college transcripts. So the next school will have no idea why that person left um, or, or was expelled. So here's, here's what I was just reading you um, that the victims were looking for a way to teach these people about what they did and why it was so wrong. And um, the male students said that they eventually became regretful um, and learned that saying too sorry was too easy. Uh, you know, it was a five month process and they did go through a lot of facilitation, but they, they said that they had come to see how much harder it was to um, make amends for these kinds of acts. And they, they saw that their acts weren't excusable and they, they promised to be different. And maybe, you know, for some of them, they really were different going forward in their future lives as dentists, we can only hope. So the people who participated in this at Dalhousie felt that because they took responsibility, they understood how their actions created and reinforced those gender-based harms and stereotypes that they were committed to addressing the issues. The male students went on to present what happened to them and how they had changed at a number of forums. So probably in a more punitive process, if they had simply been expelled, none of this learning and change would have occurred because it was designed to help them understand and not just to punish. And, and that is the point. 
uh, when it can happen of restorative justice, it's um, it's the whole whole goal anyway. Whether it always happens or not is another question. So one thing I thought was really interesting when I was researching employment and whether restorative justice could work in the employment situation was finding that it's really hard to change uh, ingrained and misogynistic attitudes and that some of the research is showing that men who have these attitudes double down their behavior when they're made to do traditional workplace trainings like on sexual harassment, like most big companies and government require all employees to do. And so what the research is showing is that bystander education might actually have a better chance of engendering some insight or understanding about what is so wrong about these attitudes and behaviors. And that, that's really interesting because bystander classes or trainings don't focus on saying now, you know, don't do this stuff, this stuff is bad. Instead, it focuses on getting people to understand how they can, as a group, intervene to make sure that um, people aren't harmed by sexual assault or sexual harassment. And that allows somebody who might have those tendencies to feel like they're part of a group that's intervening to prevent harm from happening, rather than feeling they are being targeted as someone who could do this kind of thing. And that's the difference. So it's, it's really interesting that um, bystander education may actually deal the best with it. Okay. Uh, I was gonna say the other thing that Restorative Response Baltimore found um, was that the training helped, you know, they, they offer training on, on conducting dialogue and that, that's their website if anybody's interested. But they're offering training um, in order to help teams, team building on campuses. And they say that they can prevent minor conflicts from escalating into formal grievances or legal battles into litigation. So um, if you're interested in that training at all, I put that link in there. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about um, systemic barriers to using restorative justice and a little bit about risk assessment for determining who can participate. And then I'm gonna open it to questions for the last 15 or 20 minutes. And we'll just uh, have a dialogue if people wanna stick around. So for those of you who are receiving grant funding through VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, um, programs that treat both survivors and offenders are ineligible for grant funding. So that's one of the problems or systemic barriers to being able to develop a restorative justice program, you can't do it with VAWA funding. Often funding for grants is only available for continuing existing programs or for evaluations, but not for developing or operating new programs. So that's one, one problem with developing a restorative justice system on campus. The theory behind punishing people, sending them to jail or terminating their employment or expelling them, the theory is that the very fact that we did that, expelled them, incarcerated them, uh, fired them, that will mean they're gonna stop offending. But what the research is finding is that that's not very likely. It's simply moving the behavior to another time and place, passing the harasser on to another campus or workplace. And like I, I mentioned earlier, often there's very little record of, of why the expulsion happened on the college transcript. That somebody had a bill in California about five years ago to include on college transcripts in California the reason for suspension or expulsion if it involved sexual assault and the governor vetoed it. So uh, it's interesting. Um, it's, it's not likely to be there. And so it's much easier to just move on. R&R, &R, if, if any of you have uh, been involved at all in the field of sex offender risk assessment, you'll know that R&R &R stands for risk needs responsivity. And it's really how current um, theory addresses sex offender specific treatment today. So it involves using empirically based risk assessment tools, meaning ones that are statistically based on research showing 
what factors about an individual offender are going to raise or lower their risk for committing another offense. Um, and I, as I mentioned earlier, research shows only a small number really in a group of sex offenders who've been convicted of a sexual offense, normally there's about 10% that are considered high risk. The majority are gonna fall into the low risk or moderate categories and only about 10% into the high risk category. So for offenders who fall into the high risk category, we'll probably want to find a way to exclude them from restorative justice processes because they're very unlikely to, to change. They may be able to, if they're sociopathic, they may pretend to change, but it's unlikely to impact how their future behavior goes. Um, we look at the risk factors and the criminogenic needs, what the problems this person has are in the treatment, because it has to match what their needs are and their ability to respond. The higher the risk level, the more treatment needed. Well, that makes sense, right? That's what the research shows. So just educational programs are very unlikely to change high risk offenders behaviors, even students, if they, even if they're young, if they're falling into that 10% of high risk, it's going to be difficult. Prevention uh, materials, education materials are not gonna do it. It's going to have to be sex offender specific and it's gonna have to deal with these converging factors of hostile masculinity and impersonal sex because those are both the hallmarks of people, uh, men in college uh, environments who have the most likelihood of committing, um, you know, a non-consensual sex acts, preying on on women who don't consent, and so it's dealing with those two risk factors that the treatment has to target. So, who is a candidate and who is not a candidate for restorative justice? Then, it's got to be either somebody who's capable of understanding the harm that that was caused, and able to feel remorse, or if they don't have they, that capability, they at least have to be rational enough to follow through on a commitment to change. They have to understand that future similar behavior will negatively impact them in some way significant enough to make them motivated to change their behavior. So it's one of the two. If you've got somebody who is either, either not going to change, it doesn't matter what you know the sanctions are, and that's pretty clear, or somebody who is incapable of understanding, somebody is sociopathic enough to not understand harm and inability to feel remorse, those people are not candidates. How do you get there? Well, that's where you have trained facilitators. They're gonna have to help judge whether or not that person meets those criteria. And that's gonna have to be part of the structured um, uh, rules for how the restorative justice process works. So a number of states are now already using sex offender specific treatment programs in California. We've been using them for 10 years here since 2010. Um, it's not intuitive treatment. It's very cognitive behavioral therapy oriented and um, it's research based. It can be modified when you've got young or first time offenders, but um, that has to be done by people who have specific training in how to do this type of treatment. And I think I mentioned most counselors on, in K through 12 schools or even on college campuses are not gonna have this kind of treatment. So really campuses need to have some kind of liaison or connection with the treatment providers in their community who have this kind of training because it's very specialized. So when we are talking about treatment for somebody who's been um, willing to admit their culpability in restorative justice, um, there is a path to long-term behavioral and attitudinal change, but they're gonna have to deal with a lot of feelings along the way, depression and anger, shame and guilt. And so treatment is really imperative. Um, motivational enhancement techniques, techniques are gonna be needed um, for those who are gonna resist actually um, benefiting from the treatment. So these are all barriers that the counselors should be trained to deal with. There's a really great project. I really encourage you if you're interested at all about this um, kind of treatment for students that you work with to check this out. <clears throat> it's called the STARSA project. 
And it was an evidence-based treatment and risk assessment system developed for college students who have been found, found responsible for sexual assault. So they developed two different approaches, one for lower risk students with protective factors and another one for higher risk students with behavioral problems or anger problems or you know, various personality pathologies. Um, they used either risk needs responsivity approaches or cognitive behavioral therapy options to deal with the behaviors. And the, the treatment program that they developed is able to challenge the distorted belief systems of the offenders, but still build respect and rapport, which is crucial for treatment to work, right? So the real keys to this system working, and I believe it was the University of Michigan. Um, if you just Google STARSA project, you, it'll come up. And I believe it was the University of Michigan. They found that assessing risk factors and finding out what the criminogenic needs were, which is R&R, &R, were the key to successful treatment of the students that they were working with. So this is really encouraging that somebody is actually thought about how this would work in the campus system beyond the criminal justice system with adults, which is where we've mostly seen it. Um, here's some, um, just uh, some resources, including the, the link to the STARSA project that I put in at the end of the slides so that you would have them. And now we've got, you know, we've got 20 minutes, so we can, I can stay behind if anybody wants to chat, just to unmute everybody, Shelby. If anybody wants to stay and ask questions or chat about this, I'm happy to do that. Good morning, everyone. This is Taylor from the Guam Coalition. Um, while we're all still here, I wanted to um, thank the ASL interpreter team in Aberdeen Captioning for assisting us and making us accessible today. Yes, thank you. And the floor is open for anyone wanting to ask questions um, with Miss Neely. I haven't had a chance to look at the chat box. It, Shelby, is there anything in the chat box I haven't addressed? Let's see if I can find it. a question that came in about 20 minutes ago um they were just asking about a student um they said the one who displayed the gun was that an international student oh no in that scenario the student who displayed the airsoft gun was not an international student but there was a group of international students watching the incident who then became afraid that they were going to be sucked into the criminal justice system as witnesses and worried about their immigration status at that point Let's see, anything else down here? Okay, yeah, I don't see anything else in the chat box. So any other- Jenna, I had a question. Uh, this is Taylor again. Okay. Um, what would you say is your best scenario for restorative justice that you, that you know or that you've been involved in? Um, I think that where it's working the best is on college campuses. There, there's a lot of college campuses at this point using trained facilitators to deal with it. And I think it's way better because for one thing, treatment works a lot better when you, when you start young, right? And so somebody who's 18 to 21 and been caught having committed a sexual assault has a way better chance of rehabilitation than if we don't deal with them and deal with it until they're 35 when they're caught or 40. Um, so I think that the campuses that are using restorative justice instead of just expelling somebody and then requiring them to do this specific type of mental health treatment, maybe during a suspension period, but um, making sure that person is doing the mandated um, accountability and treatment stuff, th that model is working the best right now. In the criminal justice system, diversion is what's being used in most um, areas that are doing any kind of restorative justice. And it's really not the same because it's, 
it's not up to the survivor and the um, the survivor doesn't get the kind of voice in diversion, which is kind of just still quasi a trial kind of thing. You don't have a trial, but this focus is still not on the harm that was done to the survivor in diversion. It's still all on the offender. So um, either diversion programs need to change to be more like restorative justice in the criminal justice system, or, you, you know, I think that's the answer is that there, there has to be more community involvement and um, change in the type of things that we do with sex offenders in criminal justice. Employment, it's, it's just beginning, it's brand new. And I don't see a lot going on there. So it's really college campuses and K through 12 campuses that are leading the way in this area. I think some, some a jurisdiction like Guam that's not as big as some jurisdictions would have a great opportunity to talk about incorporating this in their criminal justice system um, as well as in educational systems there. Um, you know, I don't know whether that's already on the table for some people. Has anybody seen anything like this on Guam? Maybe not. Well, anyway, it's been a pleasure to talk to all of you today. And if you think of something later that you wish you'd ask, just email me at info at calcasa.org and, and just say the questions for me and I'll, I'll be happy to answer it for you. Thanks everybody. Thanks for your day. Thanks interpreter. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>Thank you everyone for your time today. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. I wanted to point out in the chat, there's information on how to access these slides, as well as how to apply for continuing education units with the University of Guam. Hi, Ms. Shelby, I'm sorry. I, I was trying to figure out the unmuting. My name is Mr. Jason Cruz. Hello? Yeah, hi. Hi, Jason. Oh, hi. No, um, I was listening to an, uh, Ms. Taylor. Um, the, the program that you're actually talking about would actually be something very useful in Guam. Um, in the previous years, there have actually been a lot of cases uh, as far as reports of repeat offenders actually being released and actually not even within, I would say, not even... Uh, possibly three months they were already back in jail yeah you know so and and they this was brought up within our our, our legislature as well as the um the correctional system you know because of the fact that they wanted to know what 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 kind of programs and the the resident site was actually stating that the programs have actually not been updated for so many years yeah so this, this would actually be a breath of fresh air to actually implement here on Guam because yeah. of the fact of, of the, the number of, of sexual assaults that have actually, um, and repeaters, mind you. Yeah, yeah. And, and really that's the only way to deal with um, the ones who are likely to be recidivists that even after being punished is to either, you know, have them go through the appropriate kind of therapy or, you know, I mean, yeah, or put them away, one of the two. Right, right. So if you start with it the first time and, it, you know, give them a chance to to succeed in the program, maybe you won't have time number two. And that was the thing that they, they questioned, did this individual even receive any treatment? And according to how it actually went, he didn't receive much treatment at all. Yeah. And in a lot of so. jurisdictions, there isn't any um, sex offender specific treatment offered um, and there aren't treatment providers who've been trained on how to do that kind of treatment either. 
So that's the first hurdle is um, making sure it's the right kind of treatment, not just mental health counseling. Um, and second of all, making sure that you've got some providers who are willing to go get the training that, that it requires. There you go. You're, you're exactly right. You know, it, and you can't use the cookie cutter approach because every situation is, is indeed different and personal, you know, because it's, right. everybody doesn't just, you know, uh, I hate to use the term, um, you know, perform a sexual assault on anybody because it's the same as anybody else. It's, it's always personal. It's always different. Right. Motives are always different. Right, and everybody's got different criminogenic needs, um, things that are motivating them, different distorted right, needs, right. right? That um, that are mis, you know, misguiding their actions. That they need to have somebody help them break down, yeah, in order to lower their risk. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, I do have your email, um, so you know, I would like to actually communicate. I'm I'm going to be taking more of the classes next week as well. So yeah, for the yeah, webinars. Sure. Shoot me an so, email. I'd be happy to talk to you, Jason. Lee. Yeah. Thank you very much for today. It was, it was, um, it was interesting. You know, I liked it because it, it's, um, you know, it, like I said, the programs would, would really be something new and fresh to actually implement on Guam, but at the same time to actually have, um, our system take a look at how we deal with things because it pretty much like for the, the airsoft uh, weapon on on the campus mm -hmm. that's an automatic arrest already you know you, you they would actually have to go through the court systems uh -huh. and especially within our public schools um there's actually public law that you are not even allowed to bring any type of weapon you know per se even if it looks like a toy uh -huh. we've had kids who are actually taken in into dye custody because of that and then a child actually in um i believe it was an elementary school or middle school Wow. No, I want to say in elementary school, actually brought in his his father's weapon because he wanted to show it to his friends. Yeah. And he, he actually got detained to DOA for that. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. yeah. yeah there, there needs to be some rethinking of the statutes and, the, and a little bit more, you know, wiggle room to have, right. have the consequences fit the offense. Right. Yeah, well, okay. I, I helped set up the... Um, the sex offender treatment programs and the risk assessments for the state of California when I was a deputy attorney general. And so if people want specific information about how we do it in California, I'm certainly a resource. Great, great, great. Yeah. Cause I did see some, some uh, people on the, on the, on the webinar that I do know from uh, the court. I saw Dr. Uh, you know, Dr. Boz there and as well as the coalition. So uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you very much. You have bye a great bye. day. Yeah, All righty. Bye, guy. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. And um, have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.